Bobby. Yeah, so actually, my talk is, well, it is about web to some degree, but it's more generally about programming. <laughs> and I just use web as sort of an example for what I'm trying to get. So, yeah, programming language. So, I want to start with one that was very popular. Um, and I want to show you uh, the code from its language specification. So, I'll let you skip on, on that for a couple of seconds. Maybe some here can recognize actually what is this trying to define first of all and what language that is. <laughs> you have a guess? Peter? Yeah, that was Fortran. Yeah, indeed. So this is Fortran 4 from 1971. Um, and the only reason I use Fortran 4 is because that's the oldest version I could find online. Um, what this is defining is the syntax of the if statement in Fortran. Um, and it's a wall of text, right? And you, that was the state of the art how people mostly designed and defined the specified syntax. And of course, from our perspective nowadays, we think this is crazy. Who wants to parse this wall of text? How do you extract the actual information there? It's just like, we are used to reading this instead, right? It's so much more concise and communicates the intent so much better. It's just like ENF, right? Context free grammar. I would assume that most professional programmers are very familiar with this and can read a, a grammar. And the idea is actually, it's older than Fortran 4. It's dating back to the 50s. I think it was mostly invented, well, at least ENF, uh, as part of the Algol standardization in the late 50s. So the idea is quite old, and it has caught on since it was kind of the standard method for us. Yes? Yes. Speak up a little bit, okay? Um, I'll try. Um, okay, I'll, I want to show you another specification for if then else. Um, this is specifying something slightly different. It's specifying execution. Anybody recognize what language that is? <laughs> I mean, it's a bit harder because if then else is pretty generic nowadays. But, um, yeah, so that is Java, and that is actually the, the current language specification of Java. So again, we have this wall of text, right? <laughs> and again, it's very hard to extract the actual information there. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, this one is JavaScript. So it's a bit more structured. But it still has this very like prose-like style, COBOL-like <laughs> formulation of what's going on, and, and still rather verbose and hard to extract what you what you really want to know there. I mean, for if then else, you can probably see quite quickly because everybody knows how if then else works, right? But if you didn't know, it would take you quite some time to figure it out from this specification. <laughs> um, so, really, the information you want. There, it's just these two things, right? Um, you want to know that if the condition is true, then the if statement evaluates to the first one, to the state of one here. If it's false, then it evaluates to the state. That's the essence of what if then else is. And really, if you want to understand if then else, that's essentially what you want to know, not all these other, like, I don't know, approach. Um, and this idea, is also not new. It's all it's called structured operational semantics, some variations of it, invented around 1980 by Gordon Popkin, and it's kind of the standard way nowadays to specify some execution semantic of programming language in the academic community, etc. So it has been established there for 34 years. Um, I give you another example. This is from the Java Virtual Machine specification in this very first edition, and it's the specification of bytecode verification. And that's all it, said, it was saying about bytecode verification. And as you can imagine, that is not just like not very precise, and it also like led to all sorts of uh, inconsistencies and bugs. Actually, nobody really knew what, what this meant, right? It was very imprecise and very handy. 
So in the current edition of uh, the JVM, like over time, this has been expanded a bit. So in the current edition, I'm not going to show you the actual text. I'm just going to show you the, the table of contents um, because as you can see here, this is this section starting at page 196 and ending here. So it's 160 pages nowadays, right? What used to be this two small paragraphs. So when you look at that, and they found various bugs on the way as well, some of these bugs. Um, so looking at this, you think, is this the best we can do? <laughs> Perhaps there's something wrong here. Like, it's kind of ironic that we have accepted, like, <gasps> sort of formal notation for syntax. But syntax is like the very superficial, like, it's the most boring thing about specifying programming language, right? Yet, at least in the mainstream, we're still accepting that semantics, which is the core, the centerpiece of a, of a programming language, is just defined by lots of text combination of nice wording and wishful thinking, and most of the time the wish actually are not granted, and, and people find bugs. So my talk is about like trying to convince you that we can do better, and I, I'm i sure some people in this room will not hear anything new here. It's more like a tutorial about like how we can do it, and I use WebAssembly as an example because there we demonstrated that this is actually not just an academic thing, but it's ready for we have done it for a real thing, a complicated language in the with industrial. So, um, yeah, and why do we care first of all? Well, for formal syntax, we have accepted that there are various advantages of doing that, like in some formal notation, because we can now verify various things about the syntax that it's like uh, unambiguous, that it ha can be parsed with certain algorithms and so on. We can actually generate the parsers automatically from from the grammar, right? And that's done routinely as well. Um, and we can also do things that like generating tests that, from the grammar. But all these advantages actually also apply to formal semantics. So when we have semantics in terms of formal rules, then we can verify something about them. For example, that there are no missing rules or unreachable rules. That the whole execution that we define as the semantics unambiguous so that we have a deterministic meaning of what the program is. Um, so and then when you talk about type systems, it's all that sound and that's various properties that are being decided. Well and that we can actually generate interpreters from all students. And people have done that. Right? So not just parsers but actual interpreters. And you can generate tests, people have done that as well. It's not as routinely as as parsers, not even close, but it's possible. Um, but it doesn't stop there. Um, you can also, once you have a formal semantic, you can also prove all sorts of things. You can verify. So you can verify a compiler. To do that, you need to know what it's actually implementing and to know that you actually need properly precise semantics specification. Likewise, you can verify programs. Um, uh, you can verify that certain programs have the same meaning, so this is important when you talk about modularity and simulations. Um, and above all, having a formal semantics and making it part of your design process also is a very strong guideline to, to the design process itself. If you have this feedback loop, that generally is much cleaner and simpler design because it basically prevents you from cheating, right? You can't just put something in nice words that can wave over what you're trying to do. You actually have to make it precise and you will usually notice when something is off. Um, because suddenly it gets very complicated, and that is usually a, a red point. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, so I want to convince you of this using WebAssembly as an example. At this point, I guess most people have heard about WebAssembly and have at least a rough idea what it is. You don't really need to know much about it. I will give some small things that you need to know just for the running examples, but in general, you don't really need to understand the language here. Um, just like on a very high level, it's a low level, right? So it's something like the JVM, but more low level, and especially it's completely language. Um, somewhat counterintuitive, it's not actually a web technology, despite the misleading name. It has been uh, used in, in many environments, and it actually was intentionally designed to be that. So the, the language specification doesn't mention the web, except in one of the It also doesn't mention JavaScript. 
all of that is completely independent. Um, so just as a side remark here. And because it's not a web technology, and this name is more like a historic accident to convince management at the time that this is something worth pursuing, um, some people, including me, uh, prefer to just call it WASM to DM this as the web, and also because it's just short. Okay? Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, oh, yeah, I have another slide about all the kind of design goals and constraints we have with web assembly, which I won't go through here. There, there are some that have to do with the semantics of the language. There are some that have to do with the presentation to make it like compile efficiently in small code that we can stream and compile in parallel. For this talk, we mainly care about um, this part here. Like, we really want a well-defined and safe language because it's embedded in environments and it's meant to be a means of executing code to client side. This is really important that it's well behaved, right? To for security safety. And so if people want to do certain things with it, potentially we also want to make it easy to use. Um, and I'm happy to say that part of that effort was that to formalize this. So it's really fully formalized, and it's, I think, the first industrial language that is. So I'm really happy about this. Um, this was part of our mission to kind of demonstrate that. Sort of what my talk is about. Um, when I say fully, I really mean from the very first byte, like end to end, from the very first byte in the source code or the binary to the last bit of what happens to the execution. It's not just some high level semantics we specify, it's really end to end. And all that is in the official language that's in the specification. So, how did we do that? Well, one thing to re realize here is that it's a virtual machine, right? But a virtual machine is really just. Uh, it's not different. You have bytecode, but I mean, decoding bytecode is essentially parsing. It's slightly different looking. And validation of Java calls verification is really just touch. It's execution. So, all the textbook techniques that the academic community has developed over the last four decades for specifying, formalizing programming languages and then it's just readily. And that's what we did, right? We basically wanted to demonstrate that they, these techniques work uh, in practice and not just for toy papers. So let me step back a little bit um, and give you some idea about, so, about how you know, like the general approach to defining the language, like the modern approach, I would say. Um, there are three things you need to do, you need to define. The first is your concrete syntax, right? This is what people usually go about go about most of the time, although it's the least relevant. And that's basically implying what you're lexing and parsing out. So. And then there's the semantics, and there are actually two parts to it usually. One is the static, some often called the static semantics. <coughs> so this is what you can think of it, what happens at compile time. And so what you have to check about the program you compile, if we're talking about compiling. So it's really meaning like, What's the definition of scoping, typing rules, things like that? And then you have the dynamic semantics, which says what happens uh, at runtime, so the execution of the program, sometimes what linking means. So these are the three parts, and when you specify a language, at least when you do it formally, you usually want to separate this. And the way you do that is by abstracting away um, what's called the abstract syntax, right? So you define an abstract syntax tree. In the uh, grammar, possibly. And then all of these, oops, sorry, um, all these parts, they kind of operate on the AST. And that means that you can completely decouple the specification of these three parts. You can do them completely independently, like defining type, the type system doesn't need to know anything about the context. And that's pretty important for a separate ones. Of course, in the end, you want to kind of relate these two things at least, but I don't get in terms of the actual specification, they can be. Um, okay, so starting with abstract syntax and using WebAssembly as an example, here is the an excerpt of the, the abstract syntax for WebAssembly 2.0. Um, it's most of the most of the instructions are there. I just left out all the Cindy stuff because there's a lot of vector instructions. 
But other than that, this is roughly all there is. Um, and I obviously I'm not going to go through that, but you see here that um, there are like instructions. Um, you have a very simple type system, and at the bottom you have modules. So modules are the organized, like the, the unit of, of compilation and deployment for OS. Right? And the module contains a bunch of different kinds of, of definitions, like functions and roles and stuff like that. And you can import and export that. That's roughly what the language is. But the heart of it, of course, are the instructions. And most of them are not particularly surprising for an assembly kind of Okay, so let's start with the dynamic semantics because that's usually the most relevant or most interesting. How do we do that? Um, so first of all, one thing you have to know about WebAssembly is it's a stack machine conception, right? So you have instructions that pop something from the stack and push something back to the stack. At least conceptually, when you when the engine compiles into machine code, it of course uses registers, and the property is that you always know statically what is on the stack. So it's really just rather think about it as a way to relatively address virtual registers. It's completely static the stack. But conceptually, there is a stack and with for the object. So, for example, a small snippet here, this like pushes two constants to the stack and then adds them by popping them and pushing back to the stack. So, basically, what we want to know about this program is it's equivalent to this program. Right? Uh, we're just evaluating this addition and we could reduce this program to just that. And that's exactly what we're going to do. That's how we define the semantics of WebAssembly. You can literally turn that into a, one of these reduction rules. Um, so this is the reduction rule for the add instruction assembly. It just pattern matches two constants, constant instructions, and then produces a new one. So that thereby rewriting your code. Um, so to see how that works in the larger context, let's take a slightly more interesting example, like only slightly. <clears throat> so how, how do you now like execute a program like this based on these rules? Well, what you do is you find the first match inside the sequence of instructions, the first place that matches one on the left-hand side of one of your reduction rules. So here we only have one, but in general you have, of course, many, and there will be, has to be at least one that matches. I believe there's exactly one if you want to deterministic sequence, right? So, um, and in WebAssembly we have that problem. So we can prove there's always exactly one rule that's going to match. Um, so here, the match happens here, we can match these three instructions to the left hand side of that rule. And then we can apply this rule and just rewrite that in place to this. And now we have simplified our program. Um, and you can iterate, do that again. We now match this, and in the end we have uh, just one constant. And the way to think about it now is that we keep iterating this step until we have only constant left, constant instructions left. And those basically define the values, the result values of the code. Um, right, so the program terminates when no further reduction will apply, which should be when it's entirely reduced to values. And as a little spoiler here, with the type system, we can actually prove that this is the only way the program can terminate when it's reduced to only values. Um, so in general, what we're defining is this so-called reduction relation. It is a relation between instruction sequences, and it's a rewrite. Um, and yeah, it's sometimes called small step reduction rules, the ones I showed. There are different ways of specifying semantics, but like mostly people nowadays use small step reduction because it's the most basic. And it rewrites the program step by step essentially, and uh, as I said, until it only exists. And values are defined in, more generally as, as the sub syntax of instructions. In the case of Web 72.0, it consists of constant and also sort of complex references, which I'm not going to talk about. So you can just ignore it. Just think of constants as you 
But it's important that it's a subset of the instructions because we can always treat a, an instruction as a value as the function. Um, okay, so that was a very simple like linear thing like addition, right? You just pop two things and in place and it's very local. So how do we deal with more interesting things like WebAssembly is an assembly language, as the name kind of suggests, and so we have something like Jones control. Um, so how does that work? How do we do that? Um, one thing to know about WebAssembly, which is a bit odd for, to some people, at least that use like, assembly languages, is that control flow is actually structured in them. So you don't have completely arbitrary jumps. You only have block structure. So there is this structure <coughs> called block, which has a nested instruction sequence. And this sequence can now contain branches. So a block kind of conceptually binds a label, and you can branch them. And if you're familiar with C-like languages, this is essentially meaning that exiting this block is going to jump to the end of the block. So this is like a break state. And of course, you can nest these things. Um, and branch to any other one. But you can only branch to other ones. You can only exit. There's also kind of a, a dual or inverse thing which is called a loop. And it's very, it's almost the same except that when you branch to a loop label, it branches to the beginning. So despite the name, a loop doesn't actually loop by itself. It only provides a way of giving you backward edge, jump edge. Right? So this is like, basically when you branch to that, that's like proof. And that's all the control flow there is. Um, you cannot have more unstructured. There are some other things here which I want to skip over. You can also pass arguments with branches, but um, um, yeah. I just have a quick question. Um, yeah. Why, why did you do a, why did you set the outer block? What kind of action is happening and what not really does that? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was why why do we distinguish at the label side instead of the use side? What kind of thing? And that is more flexible because one instruction we have in WebAssembly, for example, is a BR table where you branch on, on an in, using an index into a label table. And then you don't have to distinguish. You can mix these labels, right? It's just jumping to different positions in the code. And that wouldn't work if we made it like a, a distinction at the branch side. So this is really just like. Yeah, it's just a label, right? So, um, and branching to a label, you don't care whether it's forward or backwards, but um, when you define the label, you care about whether it can be used forward or backwards. I don't know if that's sufficient. Okay. Um, I should also mention that here, so I wrote label here, which is usually what you do in the text format, but really underneath the label is, is just an index. So it's a relative block index. Just says, that, hey, I'm gonna exit to the i-th block of the surround. So if you know, if you're familiar with with like what you would especially with the green indexing, but the, um, okay. So how do we write reduction rules for that? So there we need several rules. One is perhaps the simplest one. So a block is always this kind of thing. Um, with an instruction sequence inside. So the simplest case is when we have fully evaluated the instruction sequence inside, which means there are only values. In that case, we're done with evaluating the block and can just exit it, meaning, uh, uh, just to remind what values are, that they're a subset of these instructions. We can just um, exit the block and leave the values on the stack. So that's the, the easy case. Finishing a block, completing a block. Now, what about branches? So there are two cases. So you're always in this form where the instruction sequence inside. You have a bunch of values on the left. So this is the part we've already evaluated. Another way to think about it: this is your operand step. This is what's currently on the step. And then you have branch. So this is the next thing you need to execute. In this case, it's branching to index zero, meaning it's actually a reference in this immediate block. So in that case, yeah, we want to exit that block. What we do, we evaluate the empty instruction sequence. Because we're now done with the block, so we can just exit it. It's all there is left to be done. 
And if you do that as part of a larger instruction sequence, then that means you're going to resume from, with the instruction out of the problem. Yeah? And, and what about when you start? <coughs> right, so... Like in the first method? Yeah, so in general, they are thrown away, or some of them, so you can just abandon them. Oh, okay. Um, I mentioned before that, in fact, you can pass arguments with branches that depends on the type of enable, which I'm not showing here. So in, in reality, it can be that some of the values are actually passed to here, but I'm, I'm slightly simple, just because it's not really relevant to the issue. So, but if most of the branches don't have arguments, Okay, other questions? We get a reminder just to go. Okay. <laughs> I already feel like shouting. But um, good. Um, okay, so there's one more rule, um, which is if you want the inductive case, right? So what happens if I have a branch to an outer block? And you can also define that fairly locally. So when you have this, that means we're also exiting this block, but we're also like exiting the blocks around. So the simple way to do it is we reduce to a branch like one next. And this is our definition of branch. For loops it works similarly, I'm not going to show it. Um, and then there's one another component in a language like WebAssembly. Of course it's an imperative language, so we have state. How do we deal with that? What is state? Um, here we just re rewriting instructions. Um, they have values in them, but what happens to say that is something on the side? Well, the standard way of doing that is you kind of generalize the thing, you define your reduction rule. So instead of just an instruction sequence, you have a pair of instruction sequences and a so-called store, which records every your current state, essentially, right? So, you, and this pair is often called the configuration of your code. And this, um, is really this S is just more syntax, auxiliary syntax we define. So in the case of WebAssembly, we kind of define it as a sort of record which contains like the value of all the globals you have, all the tables you have, and the bytes and all the memories you have. So, so you can have multiple memories. Don't worry about it, it doesn't matter really. Um, but yeah, and, and all these things are in WebAssembly indexed by numbers, so there are no names. That's why it's just really a list here, and, and if you refer to a global, you refer, refer to it as an index to the list of defined values. Okay, so this is really also just a piece of syntax we define on the side, and then we can define, again, reduction rules, like here's an example for loading i64 from some memory x um, at address i in that memory. So this ought to reduce to some i64 constant, c, but what is c? Yeah? That means your machine model you have stored in the memory, it just means putting it on the static port. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's heap. If you want it's heap, I mean, yeah, you can call it heap. But it's too efficient to stack. Yeah, yeah. So the stack isn't explicit, right? The stack is really implicit in the instruction sequence. You could make it explicit as well, but that has a couple of disadvantages because then you have kind of other thing you need to specify and uh, find um, invariance about by keeping it implicit that suddenly simplifies the way that set it. Okay, so the only thing we need to know is what C actually is, and we do that by some site condition on the rule. Um, we say that C is that value for which the the byte representations, so the little endian representation of that i64, some auxiliary function we need to define somewhere, matches the sequence of bytes at the address in that memory. Okay? Fairly straightforward once you parse that. How would you define the non sequence of Say again? Sorry? How would you define the uh, so this is completely declarative, right? It's just saying this is my rule. This is how I reduce, provided this uh, this uh, cycle initial rule. So this is saying kind of 
inversely saying what C has to be. It determines what C is. It doesn't give you a computational rule immediately for what C is, but it defines what semantics, what the meaning is, in the declarative function. And of course, you can turn this into an algorithm if you want by just basically doing the inverse of the bytes function. So that, that the bytes function is quite difficult, so you can obviously have an, an inverse. There is no rule for load without a Right. You need the, yeah. And again, spoilers, some of this will guarantee that this is always the case. You always have a constant. Can you think about the semicolon? It's not sequential composition. No, it's just some piece of syntax. <coughs> I, you could, could use a comma or anything. It's just a pair, really. For some reason, people like semicolons there because it's a bit more clearer separation between the two. Well, and then, like, storing is just the inverse of that, so you have two arguments here, one being a constant, and this reduces, because it's just for side effect, it reduces to the empty instruction sequence again, but this time it reduces to a modified store, S prime. And S prime is the same as S, except that we have replaced this range here, the same as here, with the byte representation. And that's the, the general idea of how you deal with state. Yeah. There's no I.O. in that. Right? Um, it's just a, a virtual ISA. But if you want to model something like I.O., then essentially what you have to do, you have to generalize your notion of state to say, to define something, specify something about the model, essentially. Um, but yeah, usually that's not part of the core semantics which is something that, some effect that is to the external world, and you don't specify that you're um, Okay, um, so I hope this kind of convinced you that actually, like, defining execution is not that hard. And when we designed that assembly, we wrote a paper that PLD, published at PLDI, and this was the entire uh, execution semantics for the entirety of work assembly model. It's just one page using this, this notation. So you can see that this is a really very effective way of communicating. I mean, this is abstracting away, of course, the details of what all the arithmetic kind of operators do, but in terms of the actual execution of instructions, this is all there is. Yeah? This thing sounds Can you make your branch some sort of solution yeah, I mean, there is uh, there is something like the dr if instruction. Where is it? Dr if is here. Probably can't read it there. But the reduction rule for dr if is it takes a constant from the stack, and if that's zero, you you reduce to empty. If it's one or something else, you reduce to an unconditional branch. That's all there is to that. And then, as I mentioned, we also have dr table and. Uh, all of them are just requiring to Okay, so the other part, static semantics. So again, we have the stack machine, so our typing discipline is maybe slightly different from what you're used to with regular programming languages. So going back to our example, we can assign types to instructions in the form of stack types. And these stack types basically say for each instruction what it's Popping from the operand stack and what it's pushing back. So the constants, for example, they just push one i32, and the add instruction pops two and pushes one. <coughs> and from that, you can also define, derive what the combined instruction sequence, what the type is of that, the overall type of that, is then this. Thing. So the stack typing generalized to instruction sequence. So typing, you can also define by some kind of relation, and it relates the instruction sequence to one of these stack types. And this is called a typing judgment typing relation. So it's calling this, um, and as I said, so the T1s are what this instruction sequence ultimately pops from the stack, or you differently, it's what it expects on the stack to be able to execute, and T2 is what it returns. It's like a function. One way of looking at 
instructions in a language like this, they are actually combinators. And sequencing is just composing combinators. If you're a functional programmer, that you might, you might enjoy that too. <laughs> OK. Um, so here are a couple of examples. We already saw a const instruction as this type, addition as this type. Here's another interesting example. The empty instruction sequence which also has a type, and it just does nothing to the same. So that's well. um, well, what, what about a non-empty instruction sequence? Uh, non-singular, non-empty. So what's the type of composing like two small instruction sequences? So this also is supposed to have some some type, T1s to T colon T3s here. But where are they coming from? Well, this depends on the types of these two instructions. So um, this holds if we know that the first instruction sequence somehow has this type, it produces some T2s, which is what the other can consume. And then you can just plug them together and get this. Right? And so these are like conditions for this to hold, and usually people write it like this, called the deduction rule or inference rule, um, where the things on the top are called premises, and the things at the bottom, the thing at the bottom is called the conclusion. And when you have rules like that, you can basically plug them together, and that gives you the, the overall type of code. And the rules about, on the top here, they are called axioms because they don't have any premise, but really they're just an instance of this more general scheme as well, where the thing on top of the bar is, okay. Um, so often people just write like this with the bar and nothing on top. Um, you probably won't have noticed this quickly, but if you stare a bit longer at this, you will notice that, okay, this is not enough to plug together two instruction sequences because these things might not actually so you need one additional rule that allows you to weaken the type of instruction sequence by assuming something in addition at the bottom of the stack or below the operating pair. Some kind of frame rule will weaken it. But just to, for complete design. That's true. Yeah? The two steps ago, you, you already brought an example for why you need this. Yes. Very good, yeah. <laughs> Previous guy, the slide that actually explained this rule of this example, but for means of time, I'll come to that. And then the, 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 the other thing you need is these were just instructions that were just, again, local. But similarly with execution, where you need state because you have something on the side. I think you sometimes need something on the side. So, for example, if you have a global get instruction, which gives you the, the value of some global x, that returns some, something of some type. But where does this type come from? So um, the thing is, you define something called a context C, where you can look it up. So this context records the types of all the things that are um, declared or defined in um, And it looks a bit like the, the, the store before, except that it has types in it, not values. Um, but this is still not good enough, because here we just like referring to C, but where is C coming from? What is our current context? So actually to make that work, we need to generalize or extend our uh, typing judgment a little bit with this thing on the left. So this now is saying, well, this typing assignment or classification holds under providing the context. And this odd symbol here is entailment and logic, and it's called current style, that's the title of my talk. Because that is the standard that appears in all these type systems and type rules. But it really just means, okay, I need to know this to be able to derive this. Um, and with that, we can now define the, the proper typing rule for what we get, where C is kind of like an input to the rule, so we can look up the type of um, Here's another example of the use of context, which is with a block instruction. So I sometimes omitted the function type here that's a type annotation on the block, which actually tells what this type is. Um, so the rule for typing block is actually that it has exactly the type that FT says it has. Um, but of course, for that to make sense, we also have to verify this that this instruction sequence matches that type. So we have a premise here 
that says that the instruction sequence also has to be done. And then the whole block has to send it. Um, and the interesting thing now is that here, in this premise, we are extending the context with knowledge about this additional label. Because this lock kind of binds the label, which we can only use inside that lock. So locally, in this rule, we extend That is, you can prove a theorem that says, okay, I have an instruction sequence that starts with an empty stack. Uh, typing tells me when I start with an empty stack, it will return some T's under some context, and that context matches, describes some store I have. So this is another thing you have to define. I'm not doing it here, but you get the general idea. The context kind of matches up what's in the store. And then two things can happen. Either this instruction sequence, when I keep uh, reducing it, it diverges, right? So it never reaches an end. So when you have loops or recursion, this can happen. Uh, but if it does not diverge, then the only thing that can happen is you terminate with values. There's no other possibility. Um, and these values have the right types, too. Right? So they have this is sequence of values still has this type T star, which we derive from the original. So we get that values of the correct value. And there's no other possibility, um, which particularly means we can't get stuck during execution. And that, what that implies is there is no undefined behavior. Because if there was undefined behavior, what that would mean is there is some rule missing somewhere. So there is a case where we can't proceed. And when we are able to prove that, we know this can't happen. We have proof this can't happen. So every possible situation during execution is well. That is what's in fact example. OK. Um, and this proof you can do on paper, and we have done. But you can also machine verify this. And people have done that as well, actually, multiple times. Different thing on proofs by companies. So we actually don't just have some school. We have machine verify some. Um, but we didn't want to stop there. We're now going next level. Um, how much time do I have? Like two minutes? Two minutes, okay. I'm mean, trying to be very quick. So, yeah, so all this formalization is, is in the standard. And um, in the standard, but also in the standard, is some plain English because many people want that for right? So basically, the standard has two formulations, two equivalent formulations of the same thing. One is formal one and one is in plain English. And this is kind of an excerpt from the, the actual spec. You see the formal rules in here, but most of it is like it's kind of all of this. So in the process is essentially a manual rendering, text rendering of these formal rules, which I did by hand. And that was very laborious. It blew up the kind of specification <laughs> tremendously, obviously. Um, and both these formats are a lot of work to do, and they're very helpful. <laughs> so we have code reviews. Uh, for changes to the spec, and it's very hard to do proper code reviews for the LaTeX because it's such a beautiful language. So all the math is in LaTeX. But also the markdown for the code is like super robust. Very different for anything which is a nightmare for the code reviews. Um, and this matters because the website is not done. 
you know, and we have many proposals for you for extending the language like eight or already completed, which is essentially what's best to go with that shift like two years ago. But there are more than 25 still active. They are sometimes quite large, so there are proposals for which the diff to the spec repository as a whole is 110,000 lines of code. Um, most of that is not the spec itself, but S2 is still like maybe 20, 30 percent of the actual spec. Um, yeah, and you also need to have the reference interpreter, which you also send when you propose, so that's kind of like yet another rendering of the same semantics, right? So you have all these different artifacts you need to uh, produce as a proposal, champion, and that's a lot of work, and kind of redundant. And error code. And as language people, we think like, okay, if we want three different equivalent outputs, we want kind of a language that does that for us, right? Um, and that's what we're working on right now. We're defining a DSL for, for writing the web So the idea is it's a single source of truth um, from which all of the other things can be generated, and which is very, it's much more easy to work with than you have additional error checking and all these things. Um, and in particular, we can do both the math from it and the natural English language. Nat for some definition of natural, right? It's not very <laughs> but, uh, uh, right. So, this DSL is one quick example of what it looks like. So this, these are some of the typing words, and you can probably recognize the ASCII art from kind of the words I showed you before. And then we can render that into nice like. Similarly, reduction rules, we can render that into that thing, um, which are like rewrite rules we saw before. But more interesting, we can also render the pros for that. So this is now just completely auto-generated from this specification. Um, and that should make writing the spec much easier. And I'm gonna finish with the overall picture we have in mind here, which is we have the spec tech kind of definition of language. And we turn that into some internal representation from that. You can both render the data back and you can render the pros. To do that, you have to go through some transformation into something called the algorithmic representation. Um, but more onward, you can also generate the cox theorem. So this is another kind of rendering of the same thing that people had to do manually before, like writing all the cock definitions. They had to manually translate from what they read in the latex spec to cock. And now we can automate that as well and other backends as well. So people are already working on Rocket has done a lean one, and there are others working on ACTA back then. Uh, so on. Um, and once we have ported the existing proofs, the existing prop, prop proofs to this now auto-generated theory, which we haven't done yet, that it gives us, uh, and they go through, that actually gives us an, a new level of assurance about what is actually in the spec because it all comes from the same source, it's just mechanically translated, so we know that there are no back bugs in the LaTeX, actually, unless our like, rendering has to this, but um, no many ones. And similarly, one thing we can also do, so this algorithmic language is essentially just an AST for the pros, and we can write a meta-level interpreter for that, and we can run that on the official web and test suite. And that passes, which means that we also have some assurance that the pros in the spec actually is what we, what we wanted to. Whereas before, there was like many possibilities of errors. So this is kind of a completely new level of assurance for a language spec that I don't think anybody has done before, so I'm pretty excited about it. Right, this is all I had, quick summary. Uh, what you should learn from this, um, the first thing you might have noticed is called WESM, not WESM, right, because it's not an acronym. Uh, you shouldn't shout on the internet. Um, <laughs> it's not a web technology. Those may be the most important takeaways from this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's a low-level and language thing, but yeah. It's formally specified end-to-end, -end, and, and really what we try to achieve here is just showing that these textbook techniques that people have developed, the academic community has developed, are actually ready for finding them. We can use them for an industrial technology. And we can apply a, a level of formal rigor that, with that that is unprecedented for industrial technology. And overall, it also, I claim, also.
because there was this feedback loop. Okay, sorry, I mean, my <laughs> Thank you, To, to web assembly, right? So um, right now, there, there are other people who have tried to do this in a more general way, and that's usually much too hard a problem. So we very consciously try to specialize yeah. all the way to web assembly. So the deal yeah, is still somewhat general. You just specify relations and syntax. So you can deal with extension, of course. But the kind of constructs that are in the DSL are, are what we need for, for the web assembly specification. And the general, the general approach, I think, would be applicable to others, but we don't have any experience with that, and you probably would need somewhat different setup. Thank you. Is there a question from Copenhagen? Yes, there is. Speak up. Hi, Andreas. Can you hear me? Yeah. Manuel here. I'm sorry. I'm in the, oh, I'm in the back room. <laughs> um, so my question, I, I totally, I, I, I totally like your goal. I mean, what we have with BNF, we, we should have with uh, description of semantics as well. And I mean, your work applying this actually to BASM uh, is, is awesome, very impressive. But I see one obstacle um, towards the goal of making this a general way of um, defining programming languages, which you may be um, have some ideas about how to how to overcome. Namely, mm -hmm. BASM is in a sense a small language because it's a core language. But with mm -hmm. typical uh, languages used by humans as opposed to targets for compiler, um, you get all the syntactic craft, all the complicated things, let's say, uh, nested pattern matching in Haskell, yeah. Yeah. which which is very hard. I mean, we've tried to, to kind of um, formalize that in, in yeah, some know, rules, yeah. right? <laughs> and and it just one rule is a whole whole page if, if, with the general variety of this syntax. So usually we, we need some pre-processing to even talk about some intermediate language. So do you have a have a, an idea how to how yeah, so, so wait, I think we need to summarize the question here. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, the question is how, how this would translate to user-facing languages, which are typically larger um, and more complicated. I would actually uh, refute the larger at this point, because WebAssembly has now become very large. Most of, so especially the next version we are working on, which now has 300 vector instructions, it has garbage collection, it has threading, it has a lot of things. It's actually quite big language at this point, but we still have managed. So with SpecTech, we have already specified all these things, and it just worked out. It was part of the proof of like the validation that we could do this. But I give you that at least the the complexity uh, of these features. I mean, this is it's a whole set of things, but in general, the complexity is somewhat smaller than what you see with the typical languages. Although the type system also got quite a bit more complicated with GC, you know, with recursive types and the structural subtyping and all that. So, yeah, I don't really know whether how, how well it would work, but I would love to see people try it. And of course, one thing to note is that we are standing on the shoulder of giants here, right? People have done this before. Um, for standard ML, which is a smaller language than, than WebAssembly, but this was basically my big inspiration for doing this, um, because they showed and we're just trying to translate that to, to yeah, industrial <laughs> settings. So I think it would be possible, but it's definitely not like a free thing. It requires quite a bit of work and compassion. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should hesitate when we're making those user-facing languages so big, right? Yeah, that's so. another point. Yeah. This, this, as, as Simon said about, I think it was Simon who said that about bonus, right? They keep you honest. This is something that keeps you honest about languages. You really see the cost of features. 